And so in previous chapters, we've described the practices used in the preparation of consolidated financial statements, and we tried to explain the rationale for those practices. Those concepts and procedures that we discussed reflect the contemporary theory of consolidated statements. This contemporary theory has evolved from accounting practices and essentially an entity theory approach to the preparation of consolidated financial statements. And we say that because, as you recall, in all of our examples, we were talking about a parent corporation, a subsidiary corporation, controlling interests, non-controlling interests, outside parties, internal parties, um, and all of those dealt with specific um, uh, entities of the organization. So traditional theory, though, has reflected parts of both parent company theory and entity theory. Parent company theory assumes that consolidated financial statements are an extension of parent statements and should be prepared from the viewpoint of parent stockholders. Under parent company theory, we prepare consolidated statements for the benefit of the stockholders of the parent, and we do not expect that non-controlling stockholders can benefit significantly from the statements. Consolidated net income under parent company theory is a measurement of income to the parent stockholders. So certain problems and inconsistencies in accounting procedures under parent company theory arise in a case in the case of less than 100% owned subsidiaries. For example, the non-controlling interest is a liability from the viewpoint of parent stockholders. Similarly, non-controlling interest share is an expense from the viewpoint of controlling stockholders. However, shareholder interests, whether controlling or non-controlling, are not liabilities under any of the accepted concepts of liability and income to shareholders does not meet the requirements for expense recognition. The idea of entity theory represents an alternative view of consolidation. The focal point of entity theory is that the consolidated statements reflect the viewpoint of the total business entity under which all resources are controlled by the entity or valued consistently. Under entity theory, the income of non-controlling interest is a distribution of the total income of the consolidated entity, and the interests of non-controlling stockholders are a part of consolidated stockholders' equity. Entity theory requires that the income and equity of a subsidiary be determined for all stockholders so that the total amount can be allocated between controlling and non-controlling shareholders in a consistent manner. And so what we want to talk about in this chapter is how we can compare and contrast the elements of consolidation approaches under the traditional parent company and the contemporary entity theories. We want to talk about how we adjust subsidiary assets and liabilities to fair values using push-down accounting. We want to talk about this idea of accounting for corporate and unincorporated joint ventures which is a fairly new phenomenon that is in gaining an increasing popularity and use. We want to identify variable interest entities, and we want to talk about how to consolidate a variable interest entity. And so we talked about this a little bit very early on, that we have this idea of a parent company theory to consolidation, which really takes the viewpoint of the parent company shareholders. And then we have this contemporary or entity um, theory, which takes the viewpoint of the total consolidated entity, um, contrasted with the traditional theory, which takes the viewpoint of the parent shareholders and creditors and um, uh, consolidates those viewpoints into statements that are from the viewpoint of the total consolidated entity. And so when we talk about income reporting, we talk about um, consolidating net income as a measure of income to parent stockholders under both the parent company and traditional theories. Entity theory, however, requires a computation of income to all equity holders, which we label total consolidated net income. Entity theory then assigns total consolidated net income to non-controlling and controlling stockholders with appropriate disclosures on the face of the, of the income statement. 
The preferred accounting practices under traditional theory show non-controlling interest share as a separate deduction from consolidated net income and report the equity of controlling and non-controlling shareholders as a single amount within the uh, consolidated stockholders equity classification. So the greatest difference between parent company theory and entity theory lies in the valuation of subsidiary net assets. Parent company theory initially consolidates subsidiary net assets at their book values plus the parent share of any excess fair value over book value. In other words, we revalue subsidiary assets only to the extent of the net asset, including goodwill, acquired by the parent. We consolidate the non-controlling interest in subsidiary net assets at book value. Although this approach reflects the cost principle from the viewpoint of the parent, it leads to inconsistent treatment of controlling and non-controlling interest in the consolidated financial statements and to a balance sheet valuation that reflects neither historical value nor fair value. Entity theory consolidates subsidiary assets and liabilities at fair values and accounts for the controlling and non-controlling interest in those net assets consistently. However, this consistent treatment is obtained through the practice of imputing a total subsidiary valuation on the basis of the price paid by the parent for its controlling interest. And so conceptually, this valuation approach has considerable appeal when the parent acquires essentially all of the subsidiary stock for cash. But it has less appeal when the parent acquires a slim majority of the subsidiary's outstanding stock for non-cash assets or through an exchange of shares. And so in our examples here, we see that land with a book value of $50,000 and a fair value of $80,000 would be consolidated at $80,000 if the parent owned 100%, but at $71,000 if the parent owned 70%, and that's by taking the $50,000 book value plus the um, uh, difference in the fair value related to the 80% minus the, or the 80K minus the 50K at the 70% owned. Under the contemporary entity theory, the subsidiary assets and liabilities are consolidated at fair value, so land would be consolidated at $80,000 regardless of the ownership percentage. So we can see there are some um, pretty significant differences between um, the accounting for um, uh, asset valuations based on the, um, you know, which um, theory do we buy into with respect to how we account for this. And so a difference between the parent company and entity theories also exists in the treatment of unrealized gains and losses from intercompany transactions. Although there is general agreement that 100% of all unrealized gains and losses from downstream sales would be eliminated, we accord gains and losses arising from upstream sales different treatments under parent company and entity theory. Under parent company theory, we eliminate unrealized gains and losses from upstream sales to the extent the parent's ownership to, to the extent of the parent's ownership percentage in the subsidiary. The portion of unrealized gains and losses are not eliminated relates to the non-controlling interest and from the parent point of view, view is considered to be realized by non-controlling stakeholders. We eliminate unrealized gains and losses in determining total consolidated net income under entity theories. In the case of upstream sales, however, we allocate eliminated amounts between income to non-controlling and controlling stockholders according to their respective ownership percentages. And this gives us um, examples also of the, um, you know, the difference between the treatments of, of uh, intercompany sales um, or this idea of unrealized gains and losses uh, with respect to either parent company or contemporary entity in traditional theory. And so here we see that the pattern of accounting for constructive gains and losses from intercompany debt acquisitions under the three theories parallels the pattern of accounting for unrealized gains and losses from intercompany transactions. Gains and losses on the constructive retirement of debt under traditional theory are accounted for in the same manner as under the equity theory.
And so currently, GAAP differs from entity theory in reporting consolidated stockholders' equity. Under entity theory, both controlling and non-controlling interests are components of consolidated equity. Further, equity theory would show the components of each interest, that is, breaking the controlling and non-controlling date interest into their respective shares of contributed capital and retained earnings. Under GAAP, the non-controlling interest is shown as a single combined amount under the consolidated shareholders' equity. And so here we talk about just some other ideas on consolidation with respect to disclosures. So we um, use footnote disclosures for controlling interest and non-controlling interest shares of consolidated net income. Consolidated net income is on the income statement with the distribution between uh, consolidated interest and non-consolidated interest in the notes to follow the, the financial statements. And then total consolidated equity is on the balance sheet, again, with the um, uh, controlling and non-controlling equity components included in the notes. We use proportional consolidation excluding non-controlling interest from the statements. And so now let's turn to this idea of push-down accounting um, and what does that mean. Under the theories discussed earlier in the chapter, we assign fair values to the in individual identifiable assets and liabilities and goodwill of the subsidiary by work paper entries in the process of consolidating the financial statements of the parent and subsidiary. The books of the subsidiary were not affected by the price paid by the parent for its ownership interest. And so, if you'll recall, and, and what we've worked in through through most of the semester now, we've started with the book values of the parent, the book values of the subsidiary. Through our worksheet preparation, we've uh, booked elimination entries, other adjustment entries, debits and credits, and then we've combined those rows to get across to consolidated income statements. But we haven't really touched the book, the general ledger of the subsidiaries. Um, so that gets us to this idea of push-down accounting. Um, the AICPA um, describes push-down accounting as the establishment of a new accounting and reporting basis for an entity in its separate financial statements based on a purchase transaction in the voting stock of the entity that results in a substantial change or ownership of the outstanding voting stock of the entity. When we do not push down accounting in an acquisition, we assign the implied fair value book value differential to identifiable net assets and goodwill in the consolidation work papers. And that's what we've been doing this semester. The consolidation process is simplified if the subsidiary rec records the fair values in its financial statements under push down accounting. However, this idea of push down accounting is controversial only in the separate company statements of the subsidiary that are issued to non-controlling interest because as you recall when we so if we push down this accounting to the subsidiary's record and then we roll up those subsidiary records to the parents um, um, general ledger to come up with some consolidated statements we're really where we ended up being by using our work paper method and booking our elimination entries um, but if you're a non-controlling interest and you're getting the financial statements of the subsidiary that include these push-down accounting adjustments, uh, there may be, or there will likely be, uh, distortions that may make those statements more difficult for you to use. And so the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, requires push-down accounting for SEC filings when the subsidiary is substantially wholly owned, usually 90% or more and substantially no publicly held debt or preferred stock. And so under this scenario, you can see that um, the, um, you know, we push down these accounting treatments into the books of the subsidiary, and there are really no substantially publicly held debt or stock. It, it really doesn't end up uh, being reflected in financial statements that are substantially relied upon. Um, it established a new basis. When we push this down, essentially what we're doing is establishing a new basis for the assets and liabilities based on the acquisition price. The arguments against this is that the subsidiary is not a party to the acquisition, right, and that the subsidiary receives no new funds and sells no assets. 
However, proponents counter this um, in that the price paid by the new owners provides the most relevant basis for measuring the subsidiary's assets, liabilities, and results of operations. And so that kind of counters some of these arguments against this push-down method. And so now let's just talk generally about some of what the uh, procedure or process is for um, executing this push-down method. So assets and liabilities, we said, are revalued. And remember, that's based on what the uh, parent pays for the acquisition. Goodwill, if any, is recorded. So goodwill is, under the push-down method, recorded on the subsidiary books. Retained earnings prior to the acquisition are eliminated. When we talk about how we adjust push down capital, we say that they, we create an additional paid in capital account that includes, we include any old retained earnings and we include any adjustments to this capital account um, and to assets and liabilities that include goodwill. And then a new retained earnings account is uh, used subsequent to the business combination. And so you can see from this perspective what we've done on the subsidiary's ledger is really um, book many, many of the transactions that we otherwise booked as adjusting entries to the combined parent and subsidiary trial balances in our worksheet method. And so let's get, just go through a simplified um, push-down example where PED buys 90% of SAP. SAP book values um, book and fair values are as noted below with respect to their asset accounts, cash accounts receivable. You can see book values versus fair values. So they have total asset book value of 145k versus a fair value of 245k. They have liabilities with the same uh, book value as fair value, and there's um, it's not relevant between um, a comparison between capital stock and retained earnings. And so the book value is equal to the um, uh, uh, total book value of total assets is equal to the book value of the liabilities and stockholders' equity. So if SAT applies push down accounting, it would revalue accounts receivable, inventory, plant assets, and it would record goodwill. And so here we see that um, SAD is using the parent company theory. SAD revalues the assets and liabilities only to the extent of PED's ownership. So only 90% of the increases or decreases are recorded. And so as you recall from the previous slide with respect to accounts receivable, the book value was 30K, the fair value was 35K, so there was a 5K differential. Um, because we're revaluing the assets and liabilities because we only bought 90% of those, we're only revaluing or increasing the uh, accounts receivable up 90% of the 5K differential. And we do that for each of the um, inventory or, um, as oh, I'm sorry, for each of the asset accounts. Right? And um, we record then the that amount of the um, differential uh, to the push down capital account, which is a shareholder's equity account. However, under the contemporary or entity theory, SAD fully revalues the assets and liabilities. So 100% of the increases or decreases are recorded. So again, we look at accounts receivable. You know, the difference between the fair value and the full value was 5K. So what we've done is to revalue the accounts receivable, the inventory, the plan assets, goodwill, retained earnings, um, each of those asset accounts at 100% of the increases or decreases, and with the offsetting credit being, um, again, to the push down capital account. And so again, it, this is whether we use contemporary entity theory or parent company theory with push down accounting, we're still revaluing the assets and liabilities on the books of the subsidiary. And um, with the offset being to the push down capital account, um, and, and that's the message that we're using push down accounting.
And so here we see the, the differences. The parent used 90% ownership, or the example used 90% ownership by the parent. Um, the SEC requires pushdown accounting when the firm is substantially owned, but it may be applied in other instances. And then finally, we get around to this idea of leveraged buyout with a change in controlling interest. And um, that's changing, a change in the accounting basis may be appropriate. And so, in a leveraged buyout, an investor group, often including a company management, an investment bank, or a financial institution, acquires a company from a public shareholder in a transaction finance with very little equity and very large amounts of debt. Usually, the investor group raises the money for the buyout by investing perhaps 10% of their own money and borrowing the, yet, the rest. A holding company may be formed to acquire the shares of the company. Usually, debt raised by the investors to finance the leveraged buyout is partially secured by the company's own assets and is serviced with funds generated by the company's operations or sale of its assets. Because the loans are secured by the company's assets, Banks lending money to the investors often require that the debt appear on the company's financial statements. So if a previous owner were paid a high premium for their stock, which is often the case, and book values rather than fair values of the assets are carried forward to the balance sheet of the new company, the debt incurred in the leveraged buyout may cause the new company's financial condition to look worse than it is. The popularity of leveraged buyouts is one reason many accountants support a change to push down accounting for acquisition, including leveraged buyouts. That would allow the assets of the acquired firm to be written up on its financial statements to reflect the acquisition price. And so let's switch gears now and talk about uh, joint ventures a little because we really do see uh, an increasing use of joint ventures uh, recently. And there are um, a, a lot of business reasons why joint ventures make sense to organizations. Oftentimes, um, organizations may um, uh, gain some sort of competitive advantage by forming a joint venture and uh, bringing to the table um, a mixture of firms with specialties and competencies not available in the firms individually. And so a lot of joint ventures will um, uh, uh, rise as a result of pursuit of business where organizations recognize this and they recognize they don't have the in-house talent but that you know another company does and so uh, they form these joint ventures and there are various different types of joint ventures that can be formed. And so a joint venture is a form of a partnership that originated with the maritime trading expeditions of the Greeks and Romans actually. The objective was to combine management participants and capital contributions in undertakings limited to the completion of specific trading projects. Today, joint ventures take a lot of different forms. We have um, uh, partnerships and corporate joint ventures. We have domestic and foreign joint ventures. And we have temporary as well as relatively permanent joint ventures. A common type of joint ventures is the formula formation of syndicates of investment bankers um, that are purchased securities from an issuing corporation and then market them to the public. The joint venture enables several participants to share in the risk and the rewards of undertakings that would just generally be too large or too risky for a single venture. It also enables them to combine technology, markets, and human resources to enhance the profit potential of all the partners or participants. And then other areas in which joint ventures are common tend to be land sales, oil explorations and drilling, and major construction projects. And so when we talk about joint ventures, we can talk about a corporate joint venture where a corporation owns and operates um, a small group of ventures to accomplish a mutually beneficial venture or project. We can talk about general partnerships, which is an association in which each partner has unlimited liability. Or we can talk about a limited partnership joint venture, which is an association in which one or more general partners have unlimited liability and one or more general partners have limited liability. 
Um, or we can talk about this idea of an undivided interest, and that's an ownership arrangement in which two or more parties jointly own property and title is held individually to the extent of each party's interest. So financial reporting requirements for the investors and ventures differ according to the organizational structures. Investors who participate in the overall management of the joint venture um, use the equity method, which is a one-line consolidation for the joint venture, if significant influence is not present. Uh, they would then use the um, uh, cost method. Investors with more than 50% of the voting stock have a subsidiary, not a joint venture, and so they consolidate the subsidiary. So if we're talking unincorporated joint ventures, the application of the equity method to unincorporated joint ventures is appropriate. And then there are some industry specific practices where a pro rata or proportionate consolidation is done in oil and gas joint ventures. Although the SEC recommends against proportionate consolidation for undivided interest in real estate ventures under joint control. And so we can see that there are some very specific rules and um, uh, regulations or recommendations or guidance surrounding um, the um, accounting for joint ventures. But again, these are becoming increasingly popular and so um, it's very much to our advantage to understand what joint ventures are, to understand the differences between the different types of joint ventures, and then based on that to understand how we account for the transactions under those different types. And so next we want to talk about um, these um, variable interest entities. And when we're talking about uh, variable interest entities, we're generally talking about special purpose entities that are created for a variety of valid business reasons. For example, uh, companies separately account for employee benefit plans uh, and do not include such plan accounting as part of the consolidated financial statements. GAAP sets accounting and disclosure rules for these plans. Um, special purpose entities are often afforded off-balance sheet treatment under GAAP. Companies record transactions with these entities, but they do not include the entities in the consolidated financial statements. So, for example, under our uh, benefit plans example, payments to a pension fund are recorded by the sponsor, but the assets and liabilities of the fund are not included in consolidated balance sheet asset and liability totals. We we'll report the net pension asset or liability on the balance sheet. And so again, we, we use the term variable interest entities to define those special purpose entities that require consolidations. So um, first, we have to determine does the entity meet the conditions for inclusion in the consolidated financial statements. Secondly, if consolidation is required, we have to determine how the consolidated amount should be calculated. Prior rules for the consolidation relied on uh, voting control or percentage ownership of voting control to decide both of these issues. Current GAAP, however, attempts to identify those entities in which financial control exists because of contractual and financial arrangements other than ownership of voting interest. So we just want to keep in mind that um, you know the primary beneficiary of the variable interest entity must consolidate the variable interest entity into their financial statements. And when we're talking about who the primary beneficiary is, we're talking about the organization that has the power to direct the DIE activities that most directly impacts its economic performance and has an obligation to absorb losses and or a right to receive significant benefits from the VIE. The primary beneficiary may be an equity holder or a creditor of the VIE. And so we just want to keep in mind that if um, one or neither condition is met, the reporting entity is not the primary beneficiary. And so let's go through, I'm sorry, and so let's go through a variable interest entity example. So Get Rich Quick is a VIE with equity contributed equally by 10 parties, including Kareem. 
the VIE will borrow additional amounts equal to twice the equity. The bank then becomes a major creditor or investor. Kareen agrees to absorb 75% of the losses and will take 28% of the profits. The other nine investors will share equally in what is left. So under this example, we see that Corrine is the primary beneficiary and Corrine would consolidate the VIE. The other 10 equity investors, I'm sorry, the other nine and, and Corrine, um, who are the 10 equity investors, will have to make detailed disclosures about their interest in this VIE for reporting purposes. And then lastly, we want to talk about consolidating variable interest entities. The rules essentially follow those for any other consolidation. The primary beneficiary measures and consolidates based on the fair values of the assets, liabilities, and non-controlling interest at the date it becomes the primary beneficiary. If the primary beneficiary has transferred assets to the VIE, they should be transferred at the same amount at which they were carried on the primary beneficiary's books. That is, no gain or loss is recorded on the transfer. So, for the primary beneficiary, treatment of the initial valuation is consistent with the application of GAAP for an acquisition. After the initial measurement of fair values and consolidation, the primary beneficiary follows normal consolidation principles in subsequent accounting for the VIE. So the primary beneficiary uses voting interest to allocate future performance among the controlling and non-controlling interest. All intercompany transactions and account balances must be eliminated. Income or expenses due to fees between the primary beneficiary and the VIE must be eliminated against the net income of the VIE. None of these fees um, should be allocated to any non-controlling interest. And so, Chapter 11 covered several different theories related to consolidating the financial statements of a parent and its subsidiary. It also examined this new basis accounting for assets and liabilities in a subsidiary's separate financial statements under pushdown accounting and described accounting for corporate joint ventures. We identified the concepts and procedures underlying current consolidation practices um, to distinguish from accounting practices under parent company and traditional theories. The basic differences among the three theories were, were compared and discussed, and they're included in a matrix in the text in Exhibit 11.1. .1. Nearly all the differences disappear when the subsidiaries are wholly um, owned. We said that under pushdown accounting, we record the fair values determined in an acquisition in the separate books of the subsidiary. Pushdown accounting is ordinarily required by the SEC for combinations in which all or substantially all of the ownership interests in the acquired company change hands, although some acquisitions can be structured to avoid pushdown accounting. And so this was an important chapter when we talk about you know, the context of this course being contemporary issues in accounting because Again, we see increasingly the use of variable interest entities. We see increasingly the use of, of, um, of joint ventures. And we see this new idea about pushdown accounting um, and its impact on the subsidiaries' uh, uh, books and sometimes the simplification of the consolidation process. Uh, so please go back and read Chapter 11 closely and uh, just get familiar with it and um, uh, get familiar with the terminology that's used and the, the high-level conceptual issues which are discussed. And I appreciate your time and interest and thanks very much.